altimeter, see how high above sea level I am. Welcome, COVID enthusiasts, to another episode of Jay Dunn's Garage Pandemic Edition. The car featuring today, 1930 Duesenberg. This is a LeBaron barrel side. Uh, it is a four-door car. It's got the two windshields front and back. Very cool. Straight A. You know, every Duesenberg has a story because these were the most expensive cars sold in America, certainly more than a Rolls-Royce. The most powerful car sold in America up until the Hemi came along in the 50s. So there's a lot of legends, a lot of stories. These were bought by people who were somewhat extravagant, I guess you could say. I'll show you some of the ads that Duesenberg ran back in the period. They used to have one, he drives a Duesenberg, and they'd show a guy, you know, you know piloting a, a huge sailing ship or another guy standing next to a giant fireplace in a mansion. They never even showed the car. And it was all about power and wealth and style. And uh, they are fascinating automobiles. Every Duesenberg, as I said, has a story. This one has a fascinating story. It was bought by a 17-year-old kid named William Ashton. Now, Ashton obviously came from a wealthy family, and his grandfather left him $17,000 worth of stock in the early 20s, which was huge money. When you figured a house was around $1,200, $17,000 was quite a bit of money. Anyway, the grandfather and the son were both car enthusiasts. The son's father, or the grandson, or the grandfather's child, whatever you want to call him, was not. Anyway, the grandfather and the 17-year-old decided to cash in the $17,000 worth of stock and buy 17-year-old William this uh, Duesenberg. Well, that's what they did. When they drove it home, the father was furious, threw them out of the house, two of them, just furious that they would waste this stock on a ridiculously expensive car. And of course, a couple months later, the stock market crashed. The stock was worth virtually nothing, uh, but Ashton had the car. And he held on to this car until 1958. Okay, let's fast forward to World War II. A young GI, American soldier, uh, he and his buddies were the first guys into Berlin uh, during the war, near the end of the war. They raided some German banks. They raided the safe deposit boxes, took the diamonds, the gold, whatever they could find. And they buried these items in the chassis of a motorcycle that I have next door. They sealed the bike, put it back together with the diamonds inside the tube frame of the chassis, left the motorcycle in Germany. Came back to the United States, discharged from the Army, went back to Germany a year or so later, imported the motorcycle, took out the diamonds, and bought this car. And a huge estate in Connecticut and a whole bunch of things, okay? This guy bought the car from Ashton in 1958. Uh, so Ashton had the car, what is that, 29 years, something like that? Yeah, okay. I'm only the fourth owner of this car. Anyway, the gentleman who had raided the uh, German banks and bought the car had it a short time, came despondent over a woman in a relationship, drove this Duesenberg into the garage, shut the door, left the engine running, and asphyxiated himself. What happened at that point was his brother then took possession of the car, but his brother would never sell the car to anyone who knew the story of his brother committing suicide. Uh, Duesenberg enthusiasts knew of the car, would go there and, you know, uh, hey, is it for sale? Can I buy it? Sorry to hear about your brother. And this guy would not sell it to them. I was at a motorcycle meet in uh, in Pennsylvania, I ran into the brother who now owned the car. We were talking motorcycles, and I said, do you like cars? He said, oh, yeah, too. I got a Duesenberg. And we started talking about Duesenberg, and uh, I was quite knowledgeable on Fred and Augie Duesenberg, and he seemed impressed by the fact that I knew who they were. And he said, well, I've got one that might be for sale. I said, oh, I'd love to see it. And I went to look at it, and of course, it was exactly what you look for in a barn find just a worn out, neglected, but all their car, all the sheet metal, everything was there, and it ran. It just needed everything. And we made a deal and I bought the car. And I didn't learn from him until literally years later 
the actual story. In fact, I didn't learn from him. I learned it from another Duesenberg enthusiast who made the mistake of trying to buy the car in the middle 60s and said, hey, sorry about your brother. Well, that pretty much closed it down. It only had 39,000 miles on it when uh, the brother got it in 1958, and it only had about another 1,000 miles, maybe a little bit less than that, when I got it. Uh, here are some photos of what it looked like when I got it. As you can see, it was all there. It still needed a lot of money and a lot of effort to get it uh, restored, but it was all there. I trusted it to my good friend Randy Ema, who was the premier Duesenberg specialist in the country. I mean, uh, to the point where literally has a PhD, went to college, studied this, you know, the whole court empire, the Duesenberg brothers, has every document, has every plan for every car. I mean, he, he really is meticulous in his research, and that's why I decided to let him restore this and any other subsequent Duesenbergs that I got after that. This one is still my favorite because it is the most original in the sense that the engine matches the chassis, matches. You know, Duesenbergs did a lot of engine swaps. It was not unusual back in the day to swap out an engine one for another, even to swap a body. And a lot of people would have a summer body and a winter body. They'd take it to the coach builder and swap it over. This one is exactly as it left the factory. This is what they call the LeBaron barrel side. I think there were six or seven of these made. This is the only one that does not have the folding down front windshield, which I really miss. I wish it did have it, but it's not the end of the world. These are 420 cubic inches, uh, uh, four valves per cylinder, uh, twin cam, unheard of. Every Duesenberg was built in 1928, every one of them, but it took 10 years to sell them. Uh, they hoped to sell 500 the first year, that first year, I think they produced 470 something. I'm not quite sure how many. Uh, then the Depression hit, and it took literally 10 years to sell them after that. Now, even though they're all built in 1928, why is this titled as a 1930? Because back in the day, whatever year the car was sold, that was the year it was titled as. For example, if you bought a 1937 Duesenberg, it might have full wheel covers and everything else, but it's still a 28 model but it didn't sell until 37, so it was titled as a 37. But it, it's amazing how advanced this car was for the period. I mean, most cars could barely go by, by 60 miles an hour was the end of the world. You know, I've told that story many times about my dad going, slow down, you're going a mile a minute. Well, a mile a minute was a really amazing speed back at the turn of the last century especially even in the teens, going 100 was like going 200 was today. Very few vehicles could, could actually hit 100 miles an hour. Even most motorcycles would tap out at 85 or 86. You know, the Brough Superior SS80, it went 80 miles an hour. That was like, oh my God, unbelievable. You know, so for this thing to have 265 horsepower, the most powerful engine you could get in America prior to this was the Chrysler with maybe 130 horsepower, and that was a flathead. This had 265, and then in supercharged form, it had 320. This could hit 104 miles an hour in second gear. I mean, it's one of the few classic cars you can drive as a regular car. Once I open the hood, you'll see this is not a show car. It was at one Pebble Beach in uh, 1992. And it won a few awards. I think we won our class, best in class, and we got most elegant and a few other things. Uh, my idea with these kind of cars is you restore them to 100 points, you drive them down to like five points, and then you restore them again. And that's what it should be. And this one gets driven fairly regularly. I, I love this car because you don't have to wait for anybody. It accelerates hard. Uh, it can still hit an honest 100 miles an hour, no problem. Uh, it's got four-wheel brakes. I mean, it's, some of it is, is obviously classic or vintage, but the engineering was so far ahead of its time in 1928 that, oh my God, it, well, this was the most powerful American engine you could get till the Chrysler Hemi came out in the mid-50s, and that sort of displaced it. But in terms of visual appeal and engineering, uh, it really is a tour de force. You know, uh, you always see people build replicas of cars. Um, this one would be tough to do. 
because the casting alone, uh, like combing, went through hundreds of blocks, engine blocks, trying to get the casting for this. And the heads, the machine work that was necessary to make this do what it does is unbelievable. I mean, the story of Duesenberg, the Duesenberg brothers emigrated from Germany. It was Fred and Augie, I think. Fred came when he was seven, Augie when he was five. I, I don't hold me to, I think that's what it is. They went to Iowa and then they designed their own engines and neither had any formal schooling, but they were brilliant engineers. I mean, oh my God, they won to Indianapolis a bunch of times. To this day, a Duesenberg is still the only car, only American car ever to win the French Grand Prix, which won back in 1921, I believe it was, with, with Murphy, I think. I think that's who it was. Uh, I got to double check. This pandemic thing kind of affects your mind, you know. As you can see, it's just a beautiful car, 142 and a half inch wheelbase. This would be the sport model. This is the short wheelbase model at 142. Uh, the long wheelbase model was 153 and a half. As I said, four door. You've got the second windshield here. When you put people in the back, you just flip this up and then you tighten this down like, like this here. I'll show you how that opens. Uh, why don't we go under the hood first? Now, when I open the hood, it is not as pristine under the hood because this is a working car. And as a working car, uh, they do tend to leak fluids and things, you know, uh, like any old person, I guess. Uh, well, here, I'll show you what I'm talking about. Let me open this hood. I'll turn around and set the camera up. Well, there it is, as I said, eight cylinders in line. Uh, this is the carburetor here. This is what they call an updraft carburetor. Now, you'll notice it's all deteriorated here from gas dripping. Later cars had a downdraft carburetor, which means obviously gravity would allow the gas to flow down, but the ceiling on carburetors, the jets wasn't as sophisticated or as good, and they were afraid that if the car sat too long, the fo float bowl would fill up with gas, the gas eventually leaked down into the cylinders, so they could either hydraulic, uh, or the gas would get past the rings, cars wear, and uh, dilute the gasoline. So what happened when you shut off a Duesenberg or any car with an updraft carburetor, some of the gasoline would just, instead of going down into the engine, would drip down here, and that's what all that deterioration there is. That's some gasoline dripping down. You know, I read somewhere someone said that Duesenberg was the first car to have a computer. And in a sense, it is a computer. What this does is, you see these wires, there's a series of gears and clocks. This is a lubricator. What happens is, on the dashboard, there are four lights. One comes on every 1,400 miles to tell you to check the water and the battery. One comes on every 700 miles to tell you to change the oil. Uh, one comes on to let you know every 80 miles, this comes up, Come, and then force itself down, forcing lubrication to all the chassis points, and then the fourth light to let you know to check the oil in the chassis lubricator. Uh, it's really a sophisticated thing. It, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. This is a mechanical fuel pump as well as an electric fuel pump. Down right here, that's your dipstick. When you want to drain the oil on a Duesenberg, you just flip that switch, Turn that handle, I guess would be a better way to say it. it's not a switch. And it lifts up and drains the oil out. And it just drains, obviously, in the ground. This is your oil filler right here. Uh, this is your intake manifold. Uh, the fan is on a concentric, so you can adjust the tension on the fan. Steering column here, obviously. Uh, generator. These are your twin cams up here, distributor. It's all pretty, pretty straightforward a voltage regulator. I mean, they're just a fascinating piece of kit, this whole thing. It's pretty amazing. The crankshaft, at the end of each crankshaft, I think it's 92% mercury, something like that, in the end, because what that does, that works as a harmonic balancer. The mercury actually has weight, so it goes to balancing as, as you see how incredibly smooth these engines are. They're not quiet, but they are very, very smooth. This is all cast aluminum, this, uh, this firewall right here. There's your chassis lubricator over there. I will show you that when we open the other side of the hood. This is your intake manifold. Water flows through here. I've blocked off the water manifold because it tends to eat through the aluminum. So, and it's, California is warm enough, so uh, it's, it's not a problem. Uh, these are your water jackets here. 
you know, I had an incident with this car. I was polishing this water jacket, and my finger went right through it. And I go, what's that? And then I took the water jacket off and saw how much corrosion there was. Because what I would do with this thing is I would mix the coolant, you know, and, and, the, uh, and the water. And when I was on the road and it got hot, I just opened the, the radiator cap and I put water in it to cool it off on the road. You know, obviously I threw out the, what do you call the pH balance, whatever they call it. And uh, California water has a lot of minerals, very corrosive. So it was eating through it. So that's why I use that Evans waterless cooler. It doesn't promote rust. It's life of the car coolant, and it works pretty good. It works very well. It actually runs maybe 10 degrees hotter uh, because nothing uh, transfers heat like water. But it keeps it from rusting and deteriorating, so that's, uh, I'm certainly glad I did that. All right, let's, uh, there's our twin horns right there. Let's move to, let's see. Let's go to the other side, and then we'll show you the interior of the car. Let's open the other side of the hood and show you what I'm talking about over there. All right, let's open up the right side of the car and show you what we have. Now, this is your exhaust manifold. That should be apple green, the same as uh, the block. When we did this car back, God, 30 years ago, and Randy did it, you could get that enamel or that porcelain, rather, that porcelain finish in the apple green uh, because of environmental concerns, all kinds of, you can't do that anymore. And the original manifold cracked. This is a replacement one. We just painted some kind of heat-proof green on it. Doesn't quite match. Uh, this engine bay is not as clean as it should be because this is a working car, and I use it as a car. You know, when I go to shows and I see no weeping anywhere, I realize that's not being driven, you know, that's sort of the fun part. That's where you really bond with a machine like this is when you drive it. I like to think of these sort of cracks and leaks and as sort of like, uh, you meet these old guys that work with their hands and their hands have that sort of weathered look to them, you know, and it's kind of like that or maybe like a aging supermodel whose lines on her face kind of show a lot of character. That, that's the way I look at it, so. Or maybe that's just an excuse for not cleaning the engine bay as well as I should. But um, just a wonderful car. It's your oil filter here at your water pump. This is what I was talking about before. This is where we put the chassis lubrication. You fill this with uh, heavy oil or, uh, well, heavy oil is what you use, and it shoots it to all the chassis points. The disadvantages in your garage, you're going to have four marks on the floor from where it squirts into the chassis points. That's your starter right there. There's your distributor once again. Uh, the, the intake is obviously a prettier side. Uh, this is a rain gutter right here. Most people when they're restored, the, you know, it's funny, for some reason um, almost every Duesenberg doesn't have these because people didn't know about it. They f forgot about it. This car had it originally and the idea was this would take the rain down and keep it from falling into uh, the cylinder head where the plugs are, you know. Uh, so that's a nice thing about f buying a car that's all there. You know, a lot of times you don't know what's there. You know, the average car has probably 10,000 pieces to it. So when someone says, it's 90% finished, well, that means there are a thousand parts missing. <laughs> that's, that's pretty much what that means. But this was all there, and that was sort of the greatest thing about it. Uh, I, I, as I said, I'm only the fourth owner, so it runs and drives as it should. It's got the correct steering box. It's got everything that came with the car. This is one of the early cars that still has the mahogany running boards on it. Uh, come on, let me shut this hood, and uh, we'll take you around the vehicle. Now, notice I'm not locking it just yet. One annoying thing about Duesenbergs is every lock has its own key. I would have just had one key do everything, but you need a key for the left side, the key for the right side. You know, one time I was driving this and I had a fire under the hood. And, well, the funny part is I couldn't find the fire extinguisher because I had the fire extinguisher made and put in a leather pouch that matched the interior. See, that way it matches the interior. Trouble with that is, 
when you're panicked in a fire, you can't find it, even though you're looking right at it because it matches the interior. So I'm going down the road. I can't find the fire extinguisher. I get out here. Okay, this is red hot. I can't open it because it's red hot. And second of all, I got keys out. So I pull into a 7-Eleven. I run into the thing, and I throw a 20 on the, on the thing. I, Give me some sodas. And I grab a whole bunch of one liter bottles of 7-Up and other stuff. I'm shaking them out. And I'm squirting them in here, trying to put the fire out. And it worked. It, it put the fire out. It was OK. It wasn't too much damage. It wasn't too bad. But it just, then I said to myself, God, what did I do with my fire extinguisher? I must have forgot to put, oh, there it is. And it was right next to the seat. But in that panic, I had, I, I, I just didn't see it, you know, which is what happens when you panic. So my first rule of thumb, don't panic. Come on, I'll show you around the rest of the car. Here's the mahogany running board I was talking about. This is uh, the battery box. This is obviously where the batteries are. I'm going to take a guess and hope this is the correct key. No, it isn't. I took the right key. All right, let me see. Hang on. See, this is what you do in a fire. You go like this. Oh, is this it? Is this it? Which one is it? Let's see. Okay, there we go. Now, I've got two Optimas in here. Normally, you'd have that big, long six volt batteries, which were quite good and quite powerful. The trouble is they gave off acid, and that would eat through this box and eat through the bottom of the door. These uh, Optimas work fantastically well. There's no fluids in them, so there's no gases to leak. So they work pretty well. Uh, these are two six volts. Got your spare tire right here. I got one on each side. Okay, let me show you how you get in the back of this thing. Uh, first, you have to reach under here and open this. It comes up like that. And you open this door like this. You had to be kind of skinny in these, these days. And you can in the back seat like I haven't been back here in years. And in here, you have just whatever you want, dust cloth rags, moist towelettes. All right, put that back up like that. And you seal it up. Bring that down. Bring the windshield up. And you're ready to go for a ride. Under here, you have your convertible top. This hasn't been up in probably 15 years. I, I, I just don't ride it with the top up. And your trunk is under here. I was going to show you how the trunk works, but the, uh, you know, uh, these zippers are a bit stuck and I've got to lubricate them. So we'll do that another time. Obviously your exhaust pipe there, and this has a cutout on the floor so you can open the exhaust to make it louder and then close it off again. That was considered the, the hot setup back in the 20s. Come around here and I'll show you uh, the gauges and the dashboard, which is pretty comprehensive. Getting in the Duesenberg, that's your cutout on the floor right there. All right, this is advanced and retard on the ignition. This is a hand throttle, meaning so if you can use it as a cruise control. When you take your foot off the gas, you can just pull that down and it'll hold it there. And this turns on your lights and parking lights. Uh, let's start with these four lights here. This is the computer that I was talking about. This one comes on. That's your chassis lubricator. It lets you know every 80 miles that will light up. Let you know it's going to pump uh, lubricant to all the chassis points. This one below it lights up to let you know to check the level of the oil oil in the chassis lubricator. This one here comes on every 700 to 750 miles to tell you to change the oil. Imagine changing the oil every 700 miles. And this one comes on every 1400 miles to tell you uh, to check the water in the battery. Okay. Uh, this is fascinating. Duesenberg was really the first American car to have hydraulic brakes. And this is a primitive anti-lock system. See, it says dry, 
rain, snow, ice. Now what it does is, you know, or the hydraulic brake system, when you press the brake, you're pushing, pushing flu fluid through a line, okay? When you adjust this, what you're doing here is you're, you're changing the size of the holes that the fluid is going through. For example, if you make them really small, then you need a lot of pressure on the brake, I meaning you can't lock up the brake. So if you're on icy roads, you limit the size of the holes, so you have to press really hard, and you can't lock up the brake, and you'll slow down. Uh, and as I said, snow, rain, dry, and that's the way that works. This is the ammeter, this is your ignition. This is your brake pressure. Now see, I'm applying 400, 450 pounds of pressure because people, that was an amazing thing to people, hydraulic brakes. They didn't trust it. Fluid in a line, won't it break? What's wrong with a steel cable? I've used that phrase of Henry Ford's, the safety of steel from pedal to wheel, but you get a lot more pressure, obviously. This gauge sticks a little bit, it's supposed to go to zero. This is your tachometer right here. This is your fuel gauge. This is your speedometer with a tripometer. This is interesting, this clock. Uh, this is really a precision instrument. Uh, it, you, you, you can use it as a stopwatch. You know, when you get, when you get a, a Hellcat or something now, it's got all the stopwatches and all those features in it. That's what this does. That's what this does. This is your oil pressure. Uh, this is a fascinating gauge here. This is an altimeter. Lindbergh had just flown the ocean. This car was built in 1928, and everybody wanted aircraft technology because that was, that was the future, you know, getting aircraft technology in your car. And this is a huge selling point, you know. Dad would come in his 12-year-old son and say, look, little Billy, that's an altimeter just like Charles Lindbergh had in his pet. Wow, you know, so that's really what, you don't really need an altimeter in a car unless you're climbing the mountains, but even then, there's nothing you can do about it. But anyway, it was just a cool feature to have, you know, and like I said before, when, when you get uh, a Hellcat or a lot of these cars now, or a, a Nissan GTR, I mean, they got, differential temperature, I mean, every kind of G-force, whatever, things you don't really need or use, but they're just cool to have. And that was one of them, having an altimeter. Let's show you the tool kit. Oh, pretty comprehensive. These are the tools you got when you got a Duesenberg, got your water pump wrench. This is an interesting tool. This is unique to Duesenberg. The top of the uh, overhead cam covers, those knurled knobs, this fits right over there and this tightens those down. Uh, when you change a wheel, you need this. Uh, these are interesting wheels. The way they work is you put this on, you fit this in the center, when you pull this, see how this retracts? It pulls back the locking mechanism, so then you can, I've got tape around here to keep from scratching the chrome. Uh, let me show you how it fits on the wheel and see what I'm talking about. Never drive a diesel rig without this tool, because if you get a flat, you're never gonna change a tire. There's no way you can do it without this tool. You see this here? See these teeth? Okay. You put this over there, you pull that back. You fit that over, of course you have to get that on there. Remember how this is flush. Okay, when you, when you put this in, then you pull that back. You see how it pulls out the locking mechanism? Now you're free to loosen this nut and turn the wheel to tighten it or loosen it as you would. Then when you're done, put that back, pop it off, and it locks in place so the wheel cannot come loose. It's a pretty clever design, uh, but you got, <laughs> if you don't have this tool, you're screwed. If you can read all this, you got better eyes than I do. As you can see, it says left side. Once again, you see that little ridge? You put this on, you slide it in. Okay, and then you lock it on by pulling that out. There you go. Now you're free to loosen the wheel. And when you're done, it snaps back into place. Okay, 
I, I assume a lot of you have seen the top of a Duesenberg. Maybe you haven't seen underneath, so that's why I have it on our sterile Coney list here. I've got my iPhone, so I am not a photographer, obviously. There's our 25-gallon gas tank, your massively overbuilt rear end. We put 355s in it, so you get a little more cruising range. Look at the size of those leaf springs. Obviously on both sides, your hydraulic brakes. Notice you got a torque tube. That means it's like a drive shaft inside a tube. There's your muffler right up here. See this lever? This is on the floor by the driver. When you pull this, this opens and closes the, uh, the cutout for the exhaust. Uh, they usually stick. They don't really work that well. The massive chassis, there's your fuel pump there electric fuel pump see here it is this is the mechanism for opening and closing the, the cutout there's your emergency brake transmission There's a transmission right there. Look at the size of that sump. See, it's ribbed for cooling. That's, that's 12 quarts in there for your oil. Let me get underneath here. Okay. Massive radiator. As you see, very truck-like and not very clean because this car gets driven a lot. You've got a screen in here. You can drop that whole thing. Remember before I talked about that lever on, on the engine where you can drain the oil? Well, you, when you pull that, it opens this door right here, and that's how you drain your oil. You don't have to take a, 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 a nut out, I mean a screw. You, know, you, don't, you don't bolt anything. You just turn that. You don't have to take a, take a drain plug out. Massive springs in front. There you are kind of not really shock absorbers so much as dampers. Nice thing is this car has never been damaged, never been in an accident, always been well maintained, although I mean obviously it deteriorated quite a bit from 1930 when William Ashton got it until he sold it in 58. And nothing has ever really been done to it. As you saw in the pictures I showed you before from Randy Ema, um, the car was disassembled down to the last nut and bolt. Every single piece was taken off, cleaned, plated, rethreaded, whatever needed to be done. And that's basically it right there. So I just thought you'd get a, cook a, get a kick out of seeing the bottom of it. Massive brake drums. This thing actually starts pretty good. You can lock up all four wheels, which is not something you can do with a lot of cars at this period. That's that emergency brake, as I mentioned. And that's, uh, that's even the original muffler, so that's impressive. I think it's time we took this thing for a ride. Come on, let's do it. This is a car we kept completely stock. You know, a lot of times when you find old Duesenbergs, they've just been beaten to death. You know, they, the blocks have had to be re-sleeved or bored or whatever it might be. We didn't have to do anything. The only thing that we did to this, we added stronger connecting rods. We put Carrillo rods in it because the Durrell rods, I think, I think that's how you said it, original, they, were, they weren't that strong. It still has 5.2 compression, which is plenty, runs on regular fuel, but just a wonderful driving car. It's hard to realize that this was just about the most powerful car in the world when it came out. I mean, this would be like buying a Bugatti Veyron or Chiron or one of those cars today. You know, 265 horsepower was double what anybody even had close to. I mean, the Cadillac uh, V16 that came out in 32, that was, uh, that was only 180 horsepower, I believe. People give you the thumbs up in this car all the time. The nice thing is you can drive it like a, you don't have to drive it like an antique car. You keep your foot in it all day long if you want. It just pulls so strong. Check my altimeter, see how high above sea level I am. 
Don't know why I need that. I mean, I would drive this to car shows in Santa Barbara or wherever, you know, an hour and a half on the freeway and this thing is nothing. Especially with 355 gears in it. Then it's just loafing. You're barely turning 1800 RPM. You know, Fred and Augie Duesenberg were race car engineers. That's what they did. So their cars don't overheat. I've never had this off to the side of the road, just shooting water all over the place in steam. Never happened. What happened with the Duesenberg brothers was they started to build their own car. They first built their own car, the Model A, about 1920, 1921. In fact, a man named Castle in uh, Hawaii bought the very first Duesenberg. I tried to get that one, but I couldn't. The car was just restored by Bruce Canepa. He did a beautiful job at one of those, uh, one of those million dollar restaurants. Oh my God, I don't know what it cost to do, but it was just unbelievable. And it was the very first Duesenberg, and I think it was just donated to a museum. It was still in the original family. They were uh, from Hawaii, I think they were pineapple farm or something like that. But they owned the very first one. And the first Duesenbergs were not particularly stylish. They were not stylish guys at Duesenberg. They were engineers. They were chassis, suspension, cooling, high performance. Style was not what they did, so their cars were a bit frumpy looking. And they probably only sold about 500 cars in the four or five years they were around. And then in 26, 27, uh, E.L. Cord came along. He, he, he was a hot shot industrialist, made a name for himself selling uh, Auburns and other cars. And uh, he told the Duesenberg, but he knew of their reputation, he said, Forget building these, I want you to build the fastest, most powerful American car ever made. In fact, I got the very last Duesenberg built by the Duesenberg brothers before they uh, built the J. It's all original car. We pulled this out of a barn here in Burbank. But that's another story. You know, it's funny, engineers have always known the power and efficiency of overhead cams and four valves per cylinder and hemi heads. It just, the metallurgy wasn't there, the machining wasn't there to incorporate it into a lot of cars. It was a very expensive proposition to do. I mean, a Duesenberg chassis was $8,500, just the chassis. By the time you put a body on it, you're probably in the $15,000 or $16,000 range. So, uh, I mean, it would be like a Bugatti Veyron today or a McLaren F1, or any one of those cars. I know a lot of you in the comment section will be happy to realize that I managed to incorporate the F1 into this segment as well. I always like to mention the F1 because it's the greatest car ever built. So, there you go. And I'll read the comments. I knew Leonard would somehow get that F1 thing in there. There you go. But you know, you put your foot in this, it does make you forget about the F1. Not for very long but for long enough to enjoy it. It's funny how they used to define power back in the day. Like when these cars were built, there was no zero to 60. Nobody even used that as a time. The idea was to slow the car down as much as you could in top gear, and then put your foot in it and see if it could pull away without snatching or lugging or, or anything like that. And this could do it easy. Also, this was a, yo. This is a three-speed. When most cars, performance cars, especially in Europe, were four speeds. It's funny in the book it says Duesenberg exactly get quite good mileage. It said you can get between 11 and 13 miles per gallon. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, that's unbelievable, isn't it? Because back in the day, that was pretty good for this much horsepower. cars you're just stuck behind a truck this thing you just put your foot in it, you pull around them and you know they steer very nicely for a heavy car this is probably 53 to 5500 pounds it steers very well especially on the move I mean it's a little tricky parallel <laughs> parallel parking but once you're on the road oh boy it handles very nice I'm turning 2500 rpm at 70 miles an hour it shows you how much more there is to go Duesenbergs were more for the Hollywood crowd. These weren't quiet like a Packard. 
You know, they weren't silent like a Rolls Royce or a Peerless. These were for people who wanted to be seen, who enjoyed being seen. Extroverts, I guess you call them. There's a wonderful book by a guy named Albert called The Mightiest Motor Car. It's about the Duesenberg. It's all letters from owners who bought them in period, who bought them new. The book was published in 51, so that's when this car was really still the fastest thing around. There was nothing close to it. It is 85 degrees uh, Fahrenheit here today in Los Angeles. I'm looking at, uh, what, 165 degrees on my uh, temperature gauge. So that's pretty amazing. The chassis on this thing is massive because People really weren't quite sure the tensile strength of metal. So they built it as heavy and as strong as it could possibly be. That's why these chassis do last forever. You know, after we did uh, the restoration on this, I invited the old boy out that I got the car from, you know, the one whose brother had died. And we had one Pebble Beach and all kind of stuff. And we took it for, I took him for a ride, you know. And I said, oh man, look at this, the brakes stop really well. And he quite seriously said, well, you know, I flushed them in 62 and uh, I put new fluid in. I went, oh, well, that's probably why. Yeah, yeah. It's hard to convey the impact this car had on the public. You know, just the term, it's a doozy, referring to a Duesenberg. Although I've heard people say, oh, it's a term from Broadway, it could mean something else. But I think everyone used it in relationship to the car, saying, oh, well, she's a doozy, it's a doozy, meaning something was just, you know, unbelievably good. You know, I've driven a lot of cars in this period. I saw the Fashini, that was a straight A, that was 160 horsepower. That was the most powerful engine up to its point. Uh, you know, Silver Ghost, all kinds of stuff. To me, nothing compares to this. Even SSK Mercedes feels very truck-like compared to a Duesenberg. Again, four valves, Hemi head, twin cam, seven liter. Unbelievable. You know, I feel sorry for future generations because there, there are no undiscovered Duesenbergs out there. I always get this call, hey, Miss Lana, we found this dude. No, everyone is accounted for. Uh, I think there are still 375, some, some amazing uh, low attrition rate that are out there. People always knew they were special. Some got crushed for the war effort, but for the most part, they all remain. In fact, uh, that Duesenberg town car I got was the last original owner of Duesenberg. I am only the second owner of that one. And I found that in a parking garage in New York City. It's an amazing story. and we'll, uh, well, if you watch that episode, you can hear about it. But like I said, this car, is, this engine has never really been messed with. Taken apart, cleaned, everything checked, and put back together again. We just added, we just did the new rods. They're called the supercharged rods. Well, we put Carrillo's in, just to give it a little extra strength. I said before, I want to thank Randy Ema for doing just a wonderful job store in this car you know god that was over 30 years ago we did this car and uh you know he's a real historian he loves the car he loves the era he's got every document every paper i mean it's really amazing that there are people like that who cherish not just the automobiles but the history and the story so randy thank you very much and uh we got a few more Duesenbergs we'll do on this if you like Duesenberg, you saw the chassis. We did the Duesenberg chassis. Uh, and I've got a couple you haven't seen, so uh, and we'll get to those in the weeks ahead. So, again, uh, when we're done coronarizing, we'll have our crew back. But for now, we'll just keep the pandemic along. So, see you guys later. Bye bye. Mm-hmm.